As 2021 comes to a close, we find ourselves at a crossroads. To reject tradition and embrace yazification, or to not? That is the question. The new world order coming to fruition will require a great sacrifice of those things that you love, but that price is but a mere pittance compared to the overwhelming reward at the end of the rainbow. Or so they will tell you. I am Weebo Jones, and today, ladies and gentlemen, lizard people, robot men, and variants thereupon, Mr. Epsion's away this week, so I'm filling in. My name's Weebo Jones, and ladies and gentlemen, Robot men, lizard people, and variants thereupon. This week we will be discussing what it means to embrace yazification. Oh, hi, cat. According to the esteemed academic journal Urban Dictionary, the concept of yazification can be defined as the process of making something substantially better than its original version, or of having something appear to be significantly better than its similar or comparable predecessor. Appear? Appearance is the key factor here. The appearance of something better. That is what we will be focusing on. The concept of the yazification, or the process by which one has been yazified, came to predominance in the early 21st century with the inception of the yazification bot, Twitter account, Yazifybot, in November of the year of our Lord 2021. A quick glance at the library of tweets by this individual, who is not, in fact, an actual bot, will yield a litany of before and after pictures. Depicted side by side with the left hand image being the original and the right hand being the same picture post Yazification. As you can see, the process of yazification showcases a standard compilation of enhanced features. For instance, a glossier looking hair, fuller lips, whiter teeth, contoured airbrushed skin, heavily shadowed eyes, and penciled eyebrows. And when I say standard, I do so with the fullest chest of each vowel and consonant of that word. It is a fun gimmick account that works to poke fun at the copy-paste Instagram filter-esque styles developed over the last few years intended to better the looks of the masses. Yazification, a fun gimmick, but for all intents and purposes in this video, we can't forget it is in fact a lie. And it's one that I will be using as a parallel to introduce another concept with much more depth to it in hopes of easing the digestion of something I'm about to throw at you. For our purposes today, yazification falls into the later half of that initial definition that I quoted to you earlier on in this video. The appearance of being significantly better than its similar or comparable predecessor. Now, I will admit, okay, there are some areas where bringing a modern spin to an aged concept is necessary. I want to emphasize that this is not a call to obstinately seat the public squarely in the throes of traditionalism, by any means, any stretch. I may have a touch, just a touch of the grumpy old man syndrome, but I am not diluted enough to think that back in my day is a compelling argument for much of anything, really. Rather, my point is to caution against the concept of progress simply for the sake of progress. Sake. There is, in fact, a healthy middle ground, people, and a fence planted right atop it for us to sit upon and get screamed at by either extreme if you so wish to join me. As an engineer, I'm rather fond of the saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mainly because when people try to fix things, they break the thing that I spent countless hours getting to a point of working flawlessly. Barbara, if it ain't broke, don't fix it simply means leave it alone if it's working goodly. Damn it, Barbara. Think that TikTok of the reimagining of how toothbrush and tooth Toothpaste situations could work. We're offered a convoluted solution to a problem, and it's dressed up all nice and pretty with cool music and nifty camera angles and just the right amount of hardware pizzazz, only for it to get shot down by Cabby Lame in the driest delivery of a deadpan joke mine eyes did ever see. But what happens when yazification invades other more important aspects of one's life? When they tell you how it's going to go, going forward, and that you'll simply be delighted at the prospect of, say, owning nothing? You're gonna suffer. Mm -hmm. 
but you're gonna be happy about it. See this now deleted tweet that once linked to an article that has since been removed from the internet, but not from our hearts. I mean the Wayback Machine. Eight predictions for the world in 2030. All products will have become services. I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes. Shopping is a distant memory in the city of 2030, whose inhabitants have cracked clean energy and borrow what they need on demand. It sounds utopian, until she mentions that her every move is tracked and outside the city lives swaths of discontents, the ultimate depiction of a society split in two. This is reminiscent of those post-apocalyptic dystopian stories I've read about in high school where the main protagonist is unceremoniously plucked from their tepid existence within the confines of their utopian society and plopped right into the middle of a rebellion that they become the figurehead of, forced to navigate the intricacies of a civil war between the looming regime and the underdog outcasts and even more pressingly navigate a red peppercorn spicy level love triangle. Now, there are seven more predictions in this article, but this is the only one that directly pertains to the hot take in the tweet from earlier that we were reviewing. So we're just gonna go ahead and diesel our way through, moving right along into why inflation is good for us. Sure, Sunny, if you enjoy hoarding, hyperinflation, social unrest, revolts, then yes, sure, inflation is... Uh, certainly a picnic in Versailles with Marie Antoinette pre-let them eat cake. Spoiler alert, inflation is not in fact a great thing. I don't even have to have the background in economics to tell you that. I just, it's, I know it intuitively in my heart. You know it too. But for the sake of this video, we shall humor Mr. Jean Schwaz of The Intercept for the sake of comedy and education this day, dammit. Oh, my bad. His first argument centers around the real cost of debt. Things like mortgages, credit cards, student loans, and other sources going down. Inflation of 6.2% means the real value of that 14.5 trillion is now just 13.65 trillion in last year's dollars. I wonder how long it will take for that to be reflected in people's monthly vehicle payments or mortgage payments or student loan payments. Well! Because he's talking about the real cost of debt, that refers to the principal you initially owe plus interest when accounting for inflation. When accounting for inflation, you still owe that principal amount, but the flux amount has to do with interest. The problem here, ladies and gentlemen, is that while that debt of $14.5 trillion is a total figure, real interest rates, or those rates that adjust for inflation, account for only a fraction of the interest rates of total debts represented in this handy dandy little graph that I got from the center of microeconomic data that depicts household debt and credit for the fourth quarter of 2020. It seems Johnny Boy here forgot about things like, say, nominal interest which is interest that doesn't take inflation into account. So things like fixed interest rates, which are the most common form of interest for consumers, and like, you know, seven other different types of interest, I might add. Now, I very well could go into excruciating detail about interest and why this argument is disingenuous and how even if you're saving money on your interest rates adjusted for inflation, you're spending it on the inflated cost of living without an adjustment in your take home pay. Most like, I mean, I, I know he says there's like been a wage increase of 5.8% to account for inflation for working people. However, consider the link that he sources for this statistic doesn't actually work when I navigate to it. And also, also, I know I haven't seen an increase in my take home pay yet, have you guys? But that's not the point. The point is Mr. John Schwartz of The Intercept just spent three paragraphs of my life that I'll never get back dressing up inflation as a good thing for the audience by taking this great unifier of the masses, debt, something that we all have and using it as a talking point for why we shouldn't mind that the price of a Christmas ham has increased, which means that by gosh diddly, Christmas is ruined for Tiny Tim. You're getting a can of Christmas spam this year, Timmy. Bah humbug. But even Christmas spam is too generous of an ask for us plebs this holiday season when confronted by what the media wishes to convince us is best for us in these oh-so-trying times of ours. It begins with artificially manufactured meat substitutes in the form of no-kill lab-grown meat to go on sale for the first time. So, instead of a nice Christmas ham, Timmy gets petri dish packed with protein. Isn't that just a dream come true, Tiny Tim? Isn't it? I wonder how this could possibly go wrong! Insert slippery slope argument here. Biologists suggest growing human meat in labs for consumption. Ah! 
<laughs> On the matter of human lab meat, local bride person Richard Dawkins initiated the conversation with the following tweet. Tissue culture clean meat already in 2018? I've long been looking forward to this. What if human meat is grown? Could we overcome our taboo against cannibalism? An interesting test case for consequentialist morality versus yuck reaction absolutism. The American cannibal horror film, The Farm 2018, was a horror movie, not a thought experiment turned instruction manual, dicky. I can already see the plot of how this movie plays out in my head. The year is 2030. The taboos against cannibalism have fallen and lab-grown human meat is now a staple of the American diet. However, recent years have seen society fall into Great Depression. With the price per pound of meat now at an exorbitant cost and facing muscle mass loss, and with no options left on the table, the people turn to the live human meat harvesting black market for their protein. Hot diggity, that got dark real quick, didn't it? Never fear, guys. We won't be eating Tiny Tim for Christmas yet. We have other food options for food sustainability before we get to that level of desperation, don't you know? Have you tried bugs? Have you tried eating, like, actual bugs? Like, insects. Like, creepy, crawly, crittery... bugs. Have you tried that? Hello. They must be dead, but they're moving. Hmm. So the head is actually crunchy. That's gross. Insects are emerging as a sustainable source of protein, uh, requiring much less land or resources needed to produce, for example, meat. This is the best we can do? Really? Insect protein has been around for a long time, actually. More than 2 billion people rely on insects for their daily food intake. They can keep that. I want no part. But in Europe or in America, we've actually seen insects in food in the past few years. Yeah, that's called a health code violation. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got here four packets of insect snacks. So I think I'm just gonna try them separately and see how they taste like. So Mealworms are actually quite interesting. This is a type of insect that just got a green light from the European Food Safety Watchdog. How much money did they have to get paid in order to green light that? Hmm. Obviously they're the larger sort of cruncher. I wonder if she's she's got that whole like Pavlov mouthwatering sensation right now, the prospect of eating these bugs, or if she's just like barely stomaching exactly what it is she's putting in her mouth because there's not a whole lot of enthusiasm there based off of facial expressions from what i can tell not a whole lot of enthusiasm whatsoever a cricket has wings i can see its head as well it's like she's 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 taking it she's like putting it on her lips mustering up all the courage that she can to actually put that bug in her mouth and chew because it's it's not it's not just it's not just about putting in your mouth right it's the actual like crunch the <coughs> of i can't come back from this it's in too many microscopic pieces for me to get rid of this i just have to accept my fate at this juncture that's where we're at here hmm. so crickets actually remind me of seafood. That's not a selling point for a lot of people. There are a lot of people out there that don't enjoy seafood as much as they enjoy like literally anything else. I mean, I'm not one of those people, but I know like for instance, El Boyfriendo does not like seafood. Uh, I don't think he would eat bugs anyway, but it's not a selling point for him. I'm gonna try grasshoppers and this is actually the one where that I wasn't looking forward to. <sighs> See, I, I was right. There is some dread, some existential dread right here going on. That's that's the face of, I really don't want to do this. I don't know if I'm getting paid enough to do this. Hmm. They are quite pretty dry. Mm. Especially, they're actually quite spiky. I mean, the wings. 
<sighs> Gross. If we want to save the planet, the future of food is insects. Mm, nope. Fuck the planet, I'm hopping on the next rocket to Mars. Sayonara, suckers! Interestingly enough, this article starts off with the author effectively food tampering with his wife's and a vegetarian friend's cracker bites by sneaking insects into them, and that's kind of not a good way to sell insects as good to people if you have to sneak it into their food for them to eat it. He also feeds fried mealworms to his seven-year-old and um, later desiccated buffalo worms to his nine-month-old. So we got a real humdinger of a win winner here for this article author, ladies and gentlemen, don't we? <laughs> the rest of this article makes an argument for insect consumption as a way to solve the burgeoning issue of food sustainability. But I'm here to tell you that you don't have to eat bugs to end the food sustainability crisis, guys, all right? In fact, it seems like, like, like a gross overreaction of the problem. Emphasis on gross. But Weebo, our ancestors did it. Our ancestors didn't appreciate proper hygienic practices until the mid 19th century and prescribed cocaine, cocaine, as a treatment for morphine addiction. Try again. But Weebo, people in other cultures do it too. If other cultures were jumping off a cliff, would you do the same? What next though, seriously? Belly button lint for fiber? Anyway, it's beside the point. One can do their part to alleviate the food crisis by adopting habits that help and aid with sustainability and are less wasteful. All right, here's a few. A big problem with our relationship with food as a society is in what we eat and how we eat it. Avoiding highly processed foods and instead opting for more nutritious options goes a long way in helping the cause as it puts less strain on those resources used to create highly processed foods or non-nutritious foods. Furthermore, caloric intake awareness is another big one. Essentially, this means that you're probably overeating what your body actually needs to sustain itself. And effectively, this causes an inflated demand and hence a surplus of calories in the food supply that we're just not using. Which leads me to my third and the most hilarious part about this is that while you might be overeating, you're not doing so nearly enough to offset the food waste issue in at least America, I don't know about other countries, but 40% of all food produced in the US is never eaten, believe it or not. And therein lies the great big irony of it all is that 40% of food goes wasted and yet people are talking about consuming bugs and, and lab-grown human meat, <laughs> or just regular meat, I guess, technically, as alternatives to our current way of life to solve an issue that could be easily solved by just consuming less, not just consuming, but purchasing less overall and using what we have. And you know, since we're discussing super important things like the cost of living or food or inflation or the stuff that you own being unimportant to your overall happiness index, and all of this happening within the next 10 years, I guess, let's discuss where you'll be living in this grand utopic society we're yazifying into existence, shall we? Are you a basement dweller with dismal prospects for intimacy, an absent social life who despises natural light and wishes the college experience could last forever? Then boy, do we have the real estate options for you. Check out the windowless underground sleeping pods, which could rent for 1K a month. Introducing sleeping pod. Open-sided bedroom stacked bunk bed style with common spaces for lounging and cooking, plus restrictions on romantic activity and alcohol consumption. The latest in solutions to San Francisco's housing crisis, according to a proposal from ambitious developer Chris Elzey. But wait, there's more. Residents could expect to pay between $1,000 and $1,375 a month for the privilege of bunking down in one of these pods, measuring just 50 square feet. Call the number on your screen now to reserve your pod and we'll even throw in a free FEMA blanket and pillow. For down payment of $200, feathers not included. Oh wow, sounds just like college. Oh. There's more. Oh boy. So instead of my two bedroom apartment with windows, I might add, the same amount of money can get me a 50 square foot apartment, I mean underground pod, with fluorescent lighting in San Francisco. What a dream. Oh my God. 
listen, it's been a minute since I was in San Fran, but I feel like it might be a better solution to save your money and live out of your car or a tent in the woods or moving back in with your parents or living not in San Francisco if you're that desperate for a crash pad. But maybe I'm just being too harsh. Maybe underground sleeping pods in the mission aren't a bad idea after all, she said, quoting an article. Underground space is typically used for storing items, cars, bikes. So amid a housing crisis brought on by an influx of startups, problematic progressive policies, and an MBY toxicity, using subterranean methods to store people isn't the worst idea ever, especially for new arrivals who want to break into tech. I love that. I love that they referred to it as subterranean methods to store people. <laughs> you know who else <laughs> used subterranean methods to store people? <laughs> I <laughs> I'll give you a hint. He was in Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> it rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. <laughs> yes, you will, precious. You will get the hose. We'll take the bodies and put them in the basement. And maybe it won't come with natural lighting or an abundance of parking spaces because we're using that space to store the bodies or doors and walls for privacy. But we'll have a solution for that. Oh, curtains. <laughs> Are you still interested still? But if relocating to a subterranean sleeping pod in the pursuit of your dream career as a corporate drone for the Google machine doesn't necessarily strike your fancy, you do have options, never fear. Have you ever wondered what if your landlord and your boss were the same exact person? Well, ponder the orb nevermore, my fellow plebs, for Google proposes a new town like Tech Hub in Mountain View. Google the tech giant that is, is committed to providing campuses for its employees. The plans include a mix of office space, housing, retail, and event space. And of course, in keeping with appearances and the tradition of Silicon Valley, Facebook and Amazon have signed on to the idea of company-owned subsidized housing to combat the housing crisis in Silicon Valley, and in an effort to help lift up the working class. How generous of them. Isn't that just dandy? It's time for a history lesson from Weibo. Allow me to regale you with the story of the city of Pullman, Illinois, an industrial township developed in the 1880s by George Pullman, a municipality entirely owned by the Pullman Palace Car Company. Everything from housing to markets, a library, the churches, and even the entertainment created for Pullman Palace Car Company employees who resided in Pullman along with their families. Of course, this came at the cost of own ownership. You had to rent in Pullman, Illinois. Additionally, the town lacked any conventional democratic structure to it, so no elected officials subject the populace of any kind, meaning you could be evicted on incredibly short notice by your landlord, i.e. your boss. You could also be subject to random inspections by your boss, saloons, an old-timey word for bar, and town meetings were also banned, and the library itself was only stocked with Pullman pre-approved literary selections. But that was a small price to pay for such amenities and an utter utopia. This is fine. However, with the arrival of the economic panic of 1893, demand for Pullman Palace Car Company product declined among consumers, and with it, the wages and hours of the Pullman Palace Car Company workers to offset the decrease. Unfortunately, the employees' rent for the company-owned housing was not reduced in kind, nor were the price of goods at the company-owned stores adjusted for the cost of living. An oversight, no doubt, but as a result, workers went on strike for two months, which eventually led to intervention by the U.S. government and military, and Pullman was eventually annexed to Chicago. The difference between a regular municipality and one owned by the person who owes you a paycheck is simple. A corporation is not accountable to any sort of democratic process and hence gets a lot of leeway because of that. But your local government, on the other hand, is. Ceding that authority to a corporation, especially the tech giants such as Google, Facebook, and Amazon, leaves you open to risks that are copy-paste dystopian novels. For instance, you could get the iron-fisted ruling style of the Pullman, Illinois township. You could get the policing of employees' private behaviors such as in the Hershey, Pennsylvania situation. You could get evicted as an employee for going on strike in the Steinway, New York situation. Quite frankly, I don't think that these company towns are worth your 
basic freedoms, but I mean, you do you, boo-boo. The times, they are changing. They always are. For better or for worse, change is inevitable in this society, in your lifetime. You will see the evolution of society, no matter what you do or how you like it. However, I would caution against believing a salesman on the yazification of his product. Whether it be a nothing burger, like an Instagram model, or as important as housing choices, things get dressed up to look a lot prettier than they might actually be, or turn out to be. Or they might not. Who knows? There's simply no harm in digging deeper on a situation, or in getting a second, or even a third opinion, ladies and gentlemen. And if something feels too good to be true, keep in mind, it just might be. Thank you for your time.